I haven't given the last um, run of lectures because of the, the nice guest lectures from Bob and Lewis. And, and so in, in my head, we're nearing the end of the course at least. So um, what I wanted to start with was just a little um, overview of what's to come and get some input from you guys, if that's okay. So today I've prepared a, a lecture on frameworks in two dimensions that are have some very specific failure of genericness, but they're, they're otherwise generic. And we'll talk about how that affects the, the sort of polygenic Geringer, Le Mans kind of combinatorial characterization. Um, but before that, I, as I say, I want to, to go through through this. So on, on Monday, we'll have the we'll have a guest lecture from Brigitte Savatius on the rigidity of, of random regular graphs. Um, I hope there will be one more guest lecture, at least, from um, Georg Grassiger. It's not quite um, fixed yet. But, and in the, the outline for the course, I've put some specific topics for the remaining lectures, but uh, I, I would like your input. So if you, if you want to have a little think about what um, things I haven't covered or that hasn't been covered in the course that you think might be valuable or to um, say the postdocs here, if there's anything you would be willing to lecture on again as a, or, or for the first time as a, another guest lecture, then that would be great. So um, after Brigitte's guest lecture on Monday, there will be a lecture on Wednesday, but then there's the, the long Easter weekend. So I, I have missed out Easter Friday and Easter Monday. Hopefully I've got the dates right. Um, and then there'll be a lecture on the 7th, Wednesday the 7th, and then on the Friday the 9th. And then that's the end of what I've scheduled. Um, as I say, if lots of you have ideas and lots of um, enthusiasm, then we could add a few more lectures if necessary. But um, from my personal perspective, I'm, I'm a little bit tired. And so unless there's lots of um, willing guest lecturers, that might not go very far. Um, so if we stop on Friday the 9th, we'll have done 26 lectures. Plus, the effectively, uh, we tried to think of Bill Jackson's free lectures in the winter school as part of the the course, because um, that's a topic I deliberately didn't cover, because he, he went into all the details there, and we had the, the rigidity workshop and the materials mini symposium. So I'm hoping any of you taking the, the course for credit can combine these things to get enough hours for, for what you need. But if that's not true for anyone who is taking the course for credit, let me know, and that would be a motivation to, to add however many extra hours are needed. Okay, so, so that's my sort of ramble about what's to come. So I'm going to um, open the, the floor up in case anyone has any comments or wants to write anything in the chat. Are there, are there any, um, so some, some of the, the postdocs are here. So are there any, as, as experts in rigidity, are there any topics that I have omitted to cover that you think really should be covered in the, the course? Uh, Tony, were you going to do a lecture on um, Azure decompositions? Um, Azure decompositions. So yeah, it, it, it's in my oops, decompositions. It, it, in my planned outline, there would be some time spent on on this. Is that something you you think should be heard? Um, it, it's something I don't know much about, so I'd be interested to hear about. Okay, so. Yeah, there is a, a plan to, to spend some time on this. What about, say, symmetry? Do, do people feel that, that we really should have some lectures on symmetric or periodic frameworks? I feel that it may be very interesting. I, uh, I'd also like to hear about that if, if it's not too difficult. I mean, I, so, could, so, I could speak about symmetry if, if people are interested. I don't know if you wanted a guest lecturer for that. Lovely, lovely. Thanks, Dan. Very good. Yeah, so. Um, it, it's quite a big topic, but so, so it might be that we have two lectures on symmetry, but Daniel, if you could give one of them, certainly that would be brilliant. Thanks. 
<laughs> and I'll, I'll do, um, I guess, I don't know if people want to do incidentals. I, I can do like symmetry forced if anyone else, I don't know if, you, if, if, if symmetry, what is it? Incidental symmetry is also something that people want to see. Maybe someone else should do that, but I can do symmetry forced. Would it be worth having a lecture on um, room spectrum? It's kind of like symmetry, like incident symmetry for periodic stuff. If someone else wants to do that. That would be interesting. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a topic actually I know nothing about. So I'd quite like to, to listen to a lecture on that. But Sean or Left Terrace, I guess that would be one of, one of you two. So you might have volunteered yourself, Sean. <laughs> I was hoping to volunteer Lefty, but. <laughs> yeah, I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Cheers. Room spectrum, left terrace. Okay, well that, that that's that's great because that that means I, I would, if I prepared one lecture myself, then we would fill these three, and then I can see what else I I have that I, I really wanted to to cover and, and maybe do one or two more after that if there's still the willing audience to listen and I've still got the energy. Um, so I, I'll get started with the, the non-generic stuff, unless anyone wants to make any, any further suggestions, you're very welcome to volunteer or, or volunteer somebody else or, or say another topic still. Yeah, is this symmetry discussions will situations where symmetry is broken or Absent. So, so um, just just very briefly, so the, the idea in, in symmetric rigidity is that instead of having generic structures where, where there's no symmetry whatsoever, you, you would assume your graph has a, some non-trivial automorphism group. And so for example, maybe it could be a, a four cycle, but it, it so it's clearly got a, a rota C C4 rotation symmetry, but it's also realized geometrically so that the, the points are nicely rotation about some center. And then you ask this, the standard questions we've been asking about, is it rigid or is it flexible? And, and the various different um, combinatorial and matrix questions we've been asking. But given you have the symmetry rather than being generic, But this is sort of a spoiler for, for those lectures. Okay, so maybe I, I will we'll get on with um, the topic for today. So, yeah, so let's start at the, the beginning. So we, we've spent a lot of time talking about generic frameworks. And we remember, if you remember right back to the start, we talked about how if you don't make any assumption at all on the, the realization P in your framework GP, then it's a computationally difficult problem, even just I give you a framework, determine if it's rigid. Of course, we, we know for infinitesimal rigidity, we can always use the, the rank of the rigidity matrix, but in the, the non-generic case, we don't know that's exactly equivalent to, to rigidity. So, I want to weaken generic, but this is sort of a warning that I can't weaken it a lot. And in fact, what I'm going to basically show you in this lecture is, well, I hope two cases, but if I don't have time, just one case, where weakening it a very, very small amount leads to difficult, interesting questions that have um, particular uses. So as I say here, there's a wide space between generic and typical and sort of arbitrary realizations, but I'm only going to go very, very slightly away from the, the generic situation. And, and we're going to do the usual thing we do. I'm only going to talk about rigidity, but both these problems that are, both the situations I, I would like to cover, the global rigidity questions are sort of unstudied, basically. They're, they are, they look hard. And actually, in one case, I have, I have notes on it, that I, but I'd never managed to get sufficiently far. Um, so if anyone's interested in doing global rigidity in these contexts, then feel free to let me know after. Um, so the first situation is about coincident points. So in fact, well, I, I've told you this now, but um, so you can see that an obvious way gen generously can fail is if you just have two vertices, U and V, that align in exactly the same place. So clearly they can't be 
generic because they've been realized in the in the same place. But before we go into that, I had, this made me curious when I was preparing this. Um, so again, I'm going to open up the floor. What's a what's a failure of, of genericness that what, what's a, a simple failure of genericness that people might want to study? So I, as I say, coincident points is one, and I'm going to do a, a second one towards the end of the lecture if I have time. But I, I'm curious if anyone knows of any any or has any ideas of what might be a, a nice failure that you people might want to study. Points in the span of some others, so like one that lies on a line between two others. So, so you're saying a point lying on the line between two other points and having collinear points? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really. Yeah, so that's that's exactly the that's ex exactly the second situation that we'll get to at the end if I have time. But um, yes, that's, that's definitely a, a good option. So while you're thinking, another option is um, unit distance. This is a hard case. So, so we have generic coordinates for the vertices. And so if you're minimally rigid, this implies that you will have generic lengths for the edges. And so this is really the opposite of that, where you, you have all the lengths of the edges are length, the same length. And so it might as well be one because we can dilate. And so there is um, interest, for example, from zeolites in the unit distance rigidity, but this seems to be a, a hard problem. If uh, anyone has any further kinds of non-genericness, we talked about symmetry already, but then please say, otherwise I'll, I'll start talking about coincident points. What would, it, um, what would it be if you required the vertices to have integer coordinates or lie on lattice points? So, so yeah, this 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 would be interesting too. So you, you would basically have a a big grid, right? And and the so let's say it was the integer grid, and your points have to lie like this. So there there is results of um, no, is it just Bolker about grid bracing? How to do that? This this kind of question. No, but um, not not like the edges. Are also grid lines, but rather yes. Yeah, so, so you you could so in this situation the vertices are like that, but you can have diagonals. So. I I just meant um, like so. Are you thinking that the red lines in your drawing are edges in the graph? Yes. So that that, that is not as general as maybe you were saying. You're right. Yeah. And you can skip, you, you could have, you know, grid points or lattice points that don't have a vertex at all, et cetera. Yeah. Is, is the unit distance one you mentioned earlier related to sphere packing at all? Or probably so there's, this, yeah. there's this thing coming up with the sphere packing workshop as well. Yes. Maybe that's related to that somehow. I'm not sure, I'm just purely guessing. Is, is it true? Yeah, if you have two spheres that touch. Well, it'd be distance of two. Yeah, it's the sum of the two radii. And so if you, if you did have, if all your spheres were the, the same size, then yeah, then it would be a unit distance problem, yeah. Yeah, so, so I think unit distance rigidity is hard even in 2D and so the it's circle packing rather than sphere packing but I mean sphere packing would just be too hard I guess. Um, I, I don't know I just, I just guess it might be related. Yeah it, it is so, so you pack your spheres and then you 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 make a graph by taking the the centers and put edges when the the two spheres are in contact and, and then you can talk about the rigidity of the the graph of the packing and relate that to the the properties of the, the sphere the circle or sphere packing. That might I think that might be a step too far for asking someone to give a a bit too disjoint from the, the course, but 
But it, it is an interesting area. Are we talking about suggestions for things to talk about? No, no, no. I was, I was just thinking out loud in my head back to the okay. previous bit. So, so, I mean, you're right. This is talk, just talking about non-generic kinds of um, situations still. Yeah. So maybe I should get going with the coincident points because I, I, I do have quite a bit I want to, to say in this. So we're going to have, um, well, let's just jump to here. So start with a, a graph and a particular pair of vertices U and V. And I'm going to have a, a framework in R2, which is, is called UV coincident for this special pair of vertices U and V, if the locations of PU and PV are the same. But I want to study generic things subject to this condition. So I say that the framework is UV generic if when I delete one of the, the pair of coincident points, everything is generic. So in fact, it's algebraically independent. So it's the usual um, generic we've had in the, in the course. So the, the two dimensions, by the way, is only because that's when I can make combinatorial things work. You can make the same, ask the same questions in arbitrary dimensions. And you'll see we, we have a, um, an application of understanding coincident rigidity later that it is valid in, in D dimensions. So I have a, a generic framework and I add one extra vertex at exactly the same location as an existing one. And my special pair of coincident points will always be U and V. So I'll use phrases like UV coincident and UV generic to try and understand this. Okay, so since everything else is, is generic, there's certainly no other point that's coincident. So we definitely do not have coincident triples or we don't have multiple pairs of coincident points. If you're interested in, in such um, extensions, then Hakan Gula's PhD thesis um, recently did look in, into this, but it just gets even harder than um, two coincident points is already quite hard. So it's, it's uh, challenging to go much further, even though Hakan was able to do some nice results in this direction. Okay, so what, what, do, we, what do I want to say? So remember the, the idea of the, the rigidity matroid, the row matroid, the rigidity matrix, because it is just looking at the same otherwise generic but in the same matrix. If I give you two different UV generic frameworks, then we have the, the same rigidity matroid. And so we'll think of this as the UV rigidity matroid. The fact they're coincident might mean affects what the possible ranks are for certain graphs, but otherwise it's the, the same object. And we're gonna use R sub UV to denote it. And we're going to have a, the sort of usual thing. We have a rank function of this matroid, which is little r uv. And I'm only going to talk about infinitesimal rigidity, so the rank of the, the matrix. And so I'm going to define uv rigidity. So my uv coincident framework is rigid in that special realization if the rigidity matrix has the right rank. So if the rank of the matroid is 2v minus 3. So we know that we're looking at, say, Lamang graphs, two free tight graphs, because they're the ones that, that get hit this rank for generic. And we want to know actually when one of these two free tight graphs actually drops rank because of the, the UV coincidence and when it doesn't. OK, and so we also, it's also going to be useful for us to define independence in this matrix. So UV independent just means that the, the set of edges is independent in the the matroid, and I'll typically blur the lines between saying the a subset of edges is independent and just saying the graph induced by that subset is independent. So this is sort of a standard notational um, blurring I've been doing in the course. And we talk about minimal UV rigidity. So this is all kind of um, analogous to the, the standard thing. So I'm going quite fast. But minimally UV rigid, if you're UV rigid and the, the rows of the rigidity matrix are independent. So the, you have UV independence as well. Okay. So um, I, I wanted to give one example to try and show you that this is a non-trivial extension of the, the polyjet Geringer theorem. So the, the, the example is this one. So this, this graph is just the complete bipartite graph K23, which is very definitely two free sparse. It's not too free tight. It's, so it's, uh, it's very easily seen to be 
independent in the, the two-dimensional rigidity matroid. But with the coincidence of U and V, if you realize it as a, a UV coincident framework, then you end up with lots of, of, of um, collinearities. And, and so it's not so hard. And in fact, um, I think the best thing to do is just actually write down the rigidity matrix and, to, and you see that it is um, dependent. This is a, a flexible circuit, if you like that um, notation. So K22, with U and V as the part of, of size two is, is UV independent, but a third one, a third degree two hanging off of the, the two coincident points is dependent. So this is, this is saying that somehow the combinatorics has to be more subtle than just the, the two free tight condition because there are two free sparse things that aren't even tight, which are, are dependent in this um, UV rigidity matroid. Okay, so I, I'm not really gonna tell you about how the combinatorics gets around it too much. I'm gonna sort of skip that, that complication. Um, the, the answer is to think about, um, actually the guest lecture Daniel gave very early on in the course about the lovas um paper. So lovas yemeni extended the polycheck geringer theorem to to characterize the rank function of the two-dimensional rigidity matroid. And in it, they used um, one thin covers. And so the, the UV coincident rigidity matroid can be characterized in terms of, of such covers. If uh, an additional complication, you have to worry about sets in the, the cover that contain, whether the sets in the cover contain U and V or, or not contain both of them. And so the, the, the sort of, technical term in there. The paper that I'm going to reference in a moment is UV compatible families, but I'll let you look at the paper if you're um, really curious. It, it's, as I say, it's, it's just, it's a more complicated combinatorial object than just a, a counting condition. Okay, on the other hand, sorry, on the other hand, while the, the matroid that characterizes independence is more complicated combinatorial object, it still has a we still have a very nice characterization in terms of a recursive construction of minimally UV rigid things, which is basically analogous to the characterization of minimally rigid bar joint things in 2D. So you see, we're gonna use exactly the same operation. So first of all, we, we have to put this UV in, in both cases, but otherwise we have zero extensions and one extensions. We have to be slightly careful because you can already see from this example that you can think of adding this vertex as doing a one extension, uh, sorry, a zero extension on K22. And that took us from independent to, to dependent. So it, the zero extensions, even the easy zero extensions, you have to be more careful. So what does our, our zero extension look like? Well, if we do a zero extension adding Z, so that's addition of a vertex of degree two adjacent to X and Y, then what we have to be careful with is we have to set that the pair of neighbors of the new vertex is not the set of the two vertices that are coincident U and V. So it can include one of them, but not both. And we make a similar assumption for our for one extensions. So here we delete X, Y, and we add a new vertex Z, and it's Z is adjacent to X and Y, and to one of the vertex W, and we have to, to be careful that the, the pair UV is not a subset of X, Y, and W. So let me draw. So we, we delete X, Y, add Z, and have W here. So if UV was a, a subset of X, Y, Z, then say, oops, say this was U and this was V, and in effect, we've done a, a zero extension in there that we were trying to avoid. And then we've, we've also done a, obviously a, a little bit extra as well. And so it, maybe if you accept zero extensions need to avoid this, then maybe it's, it's sort of obvious that one extensions do as well. We certainly don't want to have a, an edge between U and V because they're coincident and we're talking about infinitesimal rigidity. So with U and V in the same place, then we'll have a, a zero row in the, the rigidity matrix. So that clearly is not going to be any good if we want to be a, a minimally rigid framework. So we never want to have an edge between U and V. So it can't be that U is X and um, V is Y, but we also don't want it to be uh, 
a subset. U of E, we don't want to be a subset of X, Y, W in our one extension. So these conditions on zero and one extensions make proving that these um, operations get everything in the, the uh, minimally UV rigid family harder, but it's, it's uh, doable. What's not so hard is to see that these extensions as I've defined preserve minimal UV rigidity. So this, because of the, the extra conditions, it is exactly what we did way back when, when we were proving the polycheck Geringer theorem. So for zero extension, it was just adding, um, so you just had your rigidity matrix and you add two rows and two columns and you just worry about the, the fact that this little matrix in the bottom was independent because we have lots of zeros here. So it was a, an easy thing. And then we used the collinear triangle trick for the, the one UV extension. And so again, that, that works in the, the UV world because of the, the condition that UV is not a subset of X, Y, W. Okay. So with all that, we can prove the, the theorem. So, so everything I'm saying about UV coincident so far comes from this, this nice paper of Zolt Feketer, Tibor Jordan and Victoria Kazanitsky. Um, and the, the theorem, well, the, the first of two theorems from that paper I want to mention is, so I take a graph that has two V minus three edges which have our special pair of vertices U and V, which are gonna be realized coincidentally. Then we can talk about UV independence, if and only if you can be a recursive construction. So the, the graph is UV independent, if and only if it can be generated from K4 minus UV. So K4 minus UV is this graph with U and V here. We can't go smaller because if we go smaller, we will become complete and we don't want U and V to be um, adjacent because they're coincident and we want to be independent. Um, so this is the smallest graph by a sequence of our zero UV and one UV extension operations. And, and so the combinatorial direction of this proof I've really told you nothing about, but um, in, in their paper, they work hard to characterize the, the rank function, the combinatorial uh, as, as a combinatorial matroid, it's equivalent to the rigidity matroid for UV coincident. And then this theorem falls out as a, basically as a corollary. Um, they also go a little bit further and prove a, what I think is a really nice um, extension, which characterizes um, UV rigidity in terms of deletions and contractions. So again, I've got a, a graph with a special pair of vertices U and V the graph is, is UV rigid, if and only if the graph you get from deleting the edge UV and the graph you get from contracting the edge UV are rigid. And, and notice that I was talking about UV rigidity here, so G had to be realized with U and V coincident, but on the other side of the if and only if, I'm talking about just a graph and it's rigidity. I'm not talking about UV rigid. So for the for G to be UV rigid, it has to be true that generically, after I delete any edge between U and V, if it exists, I'm rigid. And after I contract the pair U and V into a single vertex, that has to be generically rigid as well. Okay. So one direction should be relatively easy. So, so the direction that you go back follows as a, as a corollary to, the, to this, this theorem basically that I won't go into the, the details too much of, but the other direction should be relatively clear. So if, if we're rigid with U and V in the same place, then if there's an edge between U and V, it should have no effect on the, the rigidity and when you move from the non-generic to a more generic position, you should still be rigid. So it should certainly be true that G minus UV should be rigid. And G contract UV is also not so hard to, to see. It basically follows from, from this inequality. So if I look at the rigidity matrix of a generic framework GP, and I look at the rigidity matrix of the Oh, sorry, no, no, let me start again. I look at the rigidity matrix of GP where P 
GP is UV coincident, and I look at the rigidity matrix of the contracted framework, G contract UV, where I obtain the, the generic realization P hat, P bar, by putting P U and P V in the, the same place and calling the, that, and that place is the location of the new vertex, which I've called Z when I contracted U and V. And I've put everything else generically exactly as it was in GP. So the only change between P and P, P bar essentially is the, the new vertex where the contraction of U and V is put in the, the location of the where the, the two coincident things were. So then with, with that, you can really see that the matrix isn't changing all that much. And so checking this inequality is, is not so hard to, to do. Okay. So what one natural question might be, why? Why bother with uh, coincident points. So I, I want to show you that coincident points have some, some interest in a completely disjoint rigidity problem to what we, we just discussed. Um, and in fact, it's, it's uh, the general case of the problem I'm going to mention is still, still open. So we're going to talk about the, the vertex splitting operation. So for anyone who doesn't remember what, what this, this means is you have some vertex and you split it into two vertices. So this vertex got split into these two, they become adjacent. And the neighbors of the first vertex, say V go into V dash, V double dash or something. So the neighbors of V are partitioned into N1, N2, and a special D minus one neighbors. So D is the dimension. So in two dimensions, there's only one thing over here, etc. And what do the special neighbors mean? Well, these D minus one neighbors become adjacent to both of the new vertices. So V is split into V dash and V double dash. And these D minus one neighbors go to, to both of them. And then the remaining neighbors were split into N1 and N2. And N1 goes to, to V dash and N2 goes to V double dash. So N1 and N2 is just a way of partitioning the, the remaining neighbors of V one side or the other, okay? So this is this hopefully is revision from what we've seen this before. And we, we saw that Whiteley had proved that infinitesimal rigidity is preserved by vertex splitting. But notice, first of all, I want to now talk about global rigidity, but it, 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 it's trivially false without one additional assumption. So let's suppose we were working in, in two dimensions, then Here's the vertex split. So, the, so D minus one was one. So there was one special neighbor up here. Here was V to V dash and V double dash. But I could choose for all of the, the remaining neighbors of V to put them all into N1 and make N2 the empty set. Then V double dash has degree two. And we know in two dimensions that if you have a degree two vertex, you can just flip over across the, the line through the the two neighbors and find an equivalent but non-congruent realization. So we have to make an assumption in our vertex splitting operation that both N1 and N2 are non-empty. So in this case, the three neighbors of V that I drew here have to go something like two, one. Okay, so we, we assume our vertex splitting are non-trivial in that sense. So um, N1 and N2 are both non-empty. And so in this context, it con was a conjecture, I believe of Whiteley, that this operation preserves global rigidity. And there is a, a special case known that was proved by Connolly and a, a special case that I'm going to explain to you that which was proved by um, Cruikshank and Jackson that uses coincident points. So yeah, and so this is again, when the two sides are, and, not empty, then the vertex split is non-trivial. And we want to sh show that non-trivial vertex splitting preserves global rigidity. This is, in general, is still a conjecture. Oh, and there's also a special case due to, to Jordan and Tanigawa that um, is probably the most general. So I, I just definitely shouldn't have omitted to, to say that one. OK. So what I want to do is use coincident realizations. So in particular, we're gonna do our vertex split from G to 
to g dash, but for g dash, we're going to have a, a coincident realization. So just like the idea in Whiteley's argument, we realize the new two new vertices v dash and v double dash in the same place. So we put the locations of v dash and v double dash together. And so we're going to need some result. So basically what we're going to do is say, if g is globally rigid, then g dash p dash, where p dash is not generic, but it's special. It has this, this special position of the coincidence. We're going to be able to show that this works. Global rigidity transfers to global rigidity. But it's not obvious that if you're globally rigid at a special position, you're still globally rigid when you perturb to a, a generic position. So a simple example, and maybe I draw this a bit later on, but let me just say it now, is that this graph, you could realize it so that these two vertices are coincident. And then because there's an edge between them, U and V are, are locked together. So, for, so this is actually basically a triangle, which is globally rigid. So this is a, a globally rigid realization of a graph that very definitely is not generically globally rigid. It's not even generically rigid. So when I want to take the special position and move to a, say a nearby generic position, for this one, I would, I would lose. The global rigidity would disappear as I perturbed nearby. So I want to mention a, and prove a theorem of Connolly and Whiteley that allows us to do this. Okay. And so, so the, the assumption is infinitesimal rigidity, which this one didn't have. So that's why the example is not going to, to be a, a counter example. So suppose that GP is an infinitesimally rigid and globally rigid framework in RD. So P is not generic. So if P was generic, then global rigidity implies rigidity, which is equivalent to infinitesimal rigidity. But I'm not assuming P is generic. So assuming infinitesimal rigidity and global rigidity are well, it's, it's not redundant to assume infinitesimal rigidity as well. Exactly the example I just showed shows that. So I have my infinitesimally rigid and globally rigid framework that's not necessarily generic. Then the theorem tells me there exists an open neighborhood NP of P such that for all Q in this neighborhood are of P, GQ is both infinitesimally rigid and globally rigid. We already know that if you're infinitesimally rigid, you can perturb to any nearby point without affecting the rank of the, within a sufficiently small neighborhood, without affecting the rank of the rigidity matrix. So the infinitesimally rigid conclusion I'm going to take for granted in, in, this, in the proof of the theorem, and we're going to prove that we can also perturb and get global rigidity as well. And the, the proof is going to be um, what, what uh, I think Walter Whiteley calls the averaging technique. It's sort of a, um, an, maybe a, a sort of easy version of a, a Pogorilov map technique. Um, yeah, so here's the example that I mentioned before, so I, I can skip over that. Um, I mean, I, I could, since we're, we don't have that long left, omit the proof of this, but I think it is quite instructive, so I, I will give it, and that will mean I have to do the um, the collinear points version, which the, the collinear point problem will be in another lecture, I, I think, as a result. But that's okay. So what we're proving, that if you're infinitesimally rigid and globally rigid, then there's an open neighborhood NP of P, such that all, genet or all points in that neighborhood are also infinitesimally rigid and globally rigid. And so in particular, you can take your special position as long as it's both infinitesimally rigid and globally rigid and perturb to a nearby generic point, which is infinitesimally rigid and globally rigid. Okay. So we're globally rigid, so n is at least d plus two. And we're gonna suppose that for any open neighborhood, NP of P, there exists some realization P star in that neighborhood, which is not globally rigid. So that would say we don't have this open neighborhood of globally rigid things because we, it has to be true that for any open neighborhood, there is such a not globally rigid thing. And we're gonna basically contradict infinitesimal rigidity via um, so developing the average of two frameworks and the, the infinitesimal motion being the difference. But uh, let's go through it slowly. So 
there exists this P star, which is not globally rigid. This tells us that there exists some convergent sequence because this is for any, however small we want to pick the open neighborhood, there's a convergent sequence GPK of non-globally rigid frameworks that converge to GP, okay? For each of these GPKs, we know it's not globally rigid, so there exists an equivalent but non-congruent framework, GQK. And if you remember, we, want, we, we often want to get rid of isometries and not worry about them. So we're gonna assume that both GPK and GQK are in standard position. So we're gonna put the first vertex at the origin, second vertex, we're gonna have enough zeros to rule out some rotations and we keep going for how them, whatever dimension we're in, just making sure we get rid of the D plus one choose two isometries by zeroing out relevant coordinates. Okay, so we have our equivalent but non-congruent realizations for the sequences, GPK and GQK. By the, the compactness of RDV, we have a, a convergent subsequence of GQK, GQM, which converges to some limit framework GQ. And since GP was the, the limit of the, the sequence of the PKs, GQ will be equivalent to, to GP. If it's not congruent, then we found that GP, GQ is equivalent but non-congruent to GP, but GP was globally rigid. So we would contradict global rigidity. Hence, it must be that G, GQ is congruent to GP, but we've ruled out um, the continuous isometries by the standard position. So we know that GP is obtained from GQ by reflections, by, by some finite composition of the, the some of the discrete isometries of, of this place. So this is composition of reflections in coordinate hyperplanes in RD. Okay. So if we now apply this composition of reflections, the, this, um, this discrete congruence to all of the sequence GQM, we obtain a different sequence GRM, which converges to GP now because we've done the reflections from GQ to GP for the limit. And we know that GRM is equivalent but not congruent to, to GPM for each M because it's the same property was true for the GQ for the GQ sequence. Okay, so now we have this, this new sequence RM and we have our, our PMs. We're going to now look at the difference between these sequences PM and RM to get an infinitesimal motion of the averaged framework PM plus RM over two. Okay, so that's just a, a, a computation. So what we want, we're trying to check that this is an infinitesimal motion of, of this. So we have our PI minus PJ, so that's PM of VI plus RM of VI over two, minus PJ, so that's PM VJ plus RM VJ over two. And our infinitesimal motion is PM minus RM, so it's PM VI minus RM VI minus um, PM VJ minus RM VJ, and we took the dot product of these two things. And so now, now we just do some, some simple manipulations here. So the, the, the twos come out as a, a half, that we combine the PMVI minus PMVJ, so it's this bit. We take the RMVI mi minus RMVJ, that's that bit, and now we still do the dot product. We also, I think, simplify, yeah, we, we take this and this, and we take that and that to get up here. And then now, hopefully, it's in a, a form that you can see that um, we get, when we do the dot product, we get this times this squared, this times this with a minus sign, so minus the square, and then the cross terms, um, one's a plus and one's a minus, so they cancel. Okay, and so now if we go back, this is, um, we, need, we should see that this is equal to, to zero. So this is PM minus um, RM minus RM, but PM and RM, if we go back, are um, equivalent. So when we take the squares, we've got the same, the same things. So this is zero. 
but we know that PM and R and Wiley were equivalent, they weren't congruent. So the difference gives us a non-trivial infinitesimal motion, it doesn't give us an I isometry. Hence, the, the rigidity matrix of G for PM plus RM for the averaged framework, it has a non-trivial infinitesimal motion, so it can't be maximal. However, both PM and RM, right, the, the way we set things up, converge to P. So the, the average of the two frameworks also converges to P. And hence, these things that are less than maximal as for each M gives us a, a sequence of infinitesimally frame, flexible frameworks. And GP is the limit of that sequence. And limit of a sequence of infinitesimally flexible frameworks is infinitesimally flexible. And so we contradict the infinitesimal rigidity of, of GP, which we assumed in the, in the statement of the, whatever it was, lemma theorem or corollary, whatever I, I called it. Okay, so I want to stop for questions in case that, that's unclear, but I, I'm close to the end and I do want to go through the proof of this theorem. So maybe I'll do that first. And then uh, if there were any questions, we can go back. So here's the, the coincident point vertex splitting result. It was very recent. Um, resulted Crookshank and Jackson. As I mentioned before, there are other special cases of the general vertex splitting conjecture that are known, particular from um, Jordan and Tanigawa, who used the idea of non-degenerate stresses. And um, Connolly has a, a special case as well, but I, I just want to give the proof of this one because it's quite a simple coincident point proof and, and it will just take us a few minutes. Okay, so the statement is, I take a, a globally rigid graph in D dimensions and choose some vertex W. I suppose that a new graph G dash is obtained from a non-trivial vertex splitting operation, which splits W into two vertices U and V. And I can't do it in full generality, so I have to make an additional hypothesis. And that is that this new graph G dash has a UV coincident UV rigid realization. So this is the additional hypothesis that, that may not be necessary for the, in general, but it is needed for the proof technique. Then G dash is generically globally rigid in RD. Okay, so, so why is this? So I start with a, a generic framework, GP and RD. And so we know this is a, gonna be a globally rigid framework. We obtain G dash P dash by doing the vertex split at W, um, which splits W into U and V. Everything except for, for W just goes to the same place in this new realization P dash. And the two new vertices U and V are realized coincidentally at the same place where W was, okay? We know that G dash has a UV coincident UV rigid realization that tells us that every UV generic realization of G dash will be UV rigid. So this one where, because we've put everything else generically the same way it was in G, we've chosen a particular UV coincident UV rigid framework, G dash P dash, okay? So GP is globally rigid so G dash P dash is globally rigid. So why is that? So let's just draw the, the two dimensional case. We have a globally rigid thing and we split this vertex W into U and V, but we realize them in exactly the same place. So we have really there's an edge between U and V, but that edge is zero length and locks U and V together. Everything else is realized as it was before. So all the, the other edges incident just look like they do in, in G. So in, in G they're globally rigid and in G dash with this special P dash U and V are in the same place so all the edges into U and into V just look like they're into this one common vertex because of the zero length edge forces the two vertices to stay exactly the same and so all the edges into either of them look exactly the same constraint in G dash P dash as they were in GP so G dash P dash is globally rigid in RD again okay and so now we do the theorem that we went spent some time proving for Connolly and Whiteley that because we have G dash P dash is globally rigid and we have the infinitesimal rigidity property from the, the UV rigid realization G dash P dash, we can apply Connolly and Whiteley's theorem 
to see that any Q in a neighborhood of P dash, so any Q sufficiently close to P dash, G dash Q will be globally rigid. And hence from there, we can get that G dash, the graph is globally rigid. So as you see, that's actually given the, the theorem before, it's a very simple proof of a, a, a nice result. So I think this was one I definitely wanted to, to mention. Okay, so you can see that there I'm up to where I will continue the next time I, I give a, a lecture in the, the course, but I, I do want to give plenty of time for the questions. So I will open up the floor if anyone has any, any questions. I did go a little bit fast, especially through the Conley-Whiteley theorem. So if you want to ask anything, please do.